what a pleasure and a privilege to have joining us in the way that so many conversations have had to be of late on Zoom with Aaron McManus, one of the pastors at Mosaic leading the uh, Venice campus, the creative pastor, but also the host of the McManus show on Hillsong Channel. Thank you for chatting with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm super excited to do this. I'm, I'm bummed we don't get to be in the same room, but you know, this is, this is a, good, a good in between. You guys have created something so special with McManus, this kind of this safe place where people can ask questions and debate on issues of faith that maybe they don't normally get to. And having just wrapped season one, it's kind of cool to see what you guys are able to talk about. Why did you want to create that kind of space and that kind of show? Well, one, I, I, I wish I could take more credit for it, but I, but I want, I got to thank um, pastors, Brian and Bobby Houston for just creating space, like space where a kid like me, one could come to Jesus in a church like theirs in New York and then find my way back in Los Angeles and then end up doing a show on a, on a channel that I never would thought I'd have a show on to work with people that are just so lovely and brilliant and Australian. Um, no, but I, you know, when we sat down with the Hillsong team, they, they had, I think more of a vision for it than we did initially. We were a little bit skeptical as um, people in Los Angeles are. And, and so just to, just to, I think we started with this podcast about already where me and my dad would just sit down and, and, and kind of have raw, transparent conversations. And a lot of it was like, I'm a, a verbal processor and I wanted to talk about life and the things I've struggled with in my past and, and just be more transparent. I felt like people, especially with like, you know, huge movements of just kind of cancel culture and people just outing each other and blame each other. I wanted to go like, look, here's my life. It's an autopsy and let's like break down my broken moments and, and I could be more transparent and how can I do that? And, and then, and then the Hillsong team kind of approached us and, and then decided to give us lights and a stage and a team that would produce us and do this thing. And it was just really cool. So I'm actually sitting on our, um, the makeshift set because McManus was mid season in the first season. And then they were like, look, COVID happened and quarantine happened. So our amazing producers, Ben and Steve, uh, hit us up, sent us cameras. And then we built a little set in like our, I'm in the, the middle of our church right now. So this is like our middle of our theater. And we just put some screens up and we have a little set and I'm here. So all of that, like with through all of that, now we're here. For the end yeah, of the and it's so awesome. I mean, everybody's creativity and the kind of the breaking of boxes around how we do stuff has really had to happen in this season. But for anyone who's watched the show, as I have, you see that you and your dad, Erwin, really have such a strong bond and a great relationship. You're so transparent about the ups and downs of you, the sort of past that you guys have experienced. But tell us about how you have formed that bond, because I don't think all fathers and sons particularly, but fathers and their children in general, not all of them have that connection. So how have you guys made that work? You know, I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. I know that one, my dad is an incredibly patient and loving human being. And I know that like him, him coming to Jesus and having a relationship with God, he has treated me so much, so much, so much in inside of this concept of loving me unconditionally, loving me through my brokenness, through my pain, through uh, my questions and my doubts and my volatility and my anger at times. And, and I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. He didn't grow up with a dad. He had no example. He just genuinely committed uh, his life to, to being a great father, a great husband, a great um, leader. And, 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 and I remember when we were, when we were younger, he, he obviously was, he, I grew up in kind of in the ghetto in East LA and in South Dallas and, my dad was planning churches kind of in the inner city. And, and I grew up with pretty much like most of my friends were in, in and out of juvenile detention centers. And, and it was just a different, I thought I, I didn't understand what, who white people were, were growing up. And my dad was like, I, in a car on the way to church, my, my dad, I asked my dad, you know, who, what are white people? And, and he's like, your mom, look at your mom when you get home your mom's white and so I just had this concept that you know just told me when he was planning churches he, he just said if it ever gets too much for you like please let me know because I, I want to choose my family and obviously I'm choosing my he always obviously chose his calling but he never made it secondary he never made it secondary he never left us at home he always brought us with us always explained the vision always took the time to walk us through the difficult moments and really help us understand and for him there was there was no calling without um, his commitment to his family and so I'm really grateful because he never left me behind. And, and, and there's this, this, this moment where we were in an airport when I was younger and he was walking really fast and he was leaving me. And I was like, dad, wait, dad, wait, dad, wait. And he stopped and he was like, look, I'm waiting for you. I'm always going to wait for you. But remember this when I'm older, that you're going to always wait for me when, when you're running ahead. <laughs> and I, I'm reminded of that just now randomly. And, and that's just the story. That's just who my dad is. He will always yeah. wait and always, he, but he's also on this other side, he's this futurist who's just 
insanely compulsive, like I'm impulsive, compulsive, and just driven to, to, to drive towards the future. So you never know what you're going to get when you wake up in the morning. Right. I think that's so yeah. true. And I was just thinking, I mean, even if you have to wait for your dad when he's older, I don't think he's going to be going very slow because no. some people who've listened to his teachings would be familiar with the fact no. that he had surgery for cancer on his stomach and then played basketball yeah. like the moment he got out of hospital. So I feel like you'll still be able to go pretty quickly. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm still going to be catching up to him for, a, a, <laughs> for, quite a, for quite some time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but talking of the, you know, the challenges people have had with church, obviously you're not the only one who has walked that. There's a lot of people that have had their difficulties with faith and trying to understand where they fit in. But I think what you've been able to do with the show so beautifully is show how, and even with the Battle Ready podcast, find ways where people can authentically, genuinely ask questions about things they don't fully understand and where the church is actually proactively having a, a voice in discussions of whether it's race, you know, more more sort of um, right now uh, and or more recently, I should say, or yeah. anything how do you think the church can do better at being part of these really important, really real conversations? Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is one, this is a start creating spaces like this where we can ask questions and, and push the boundaries and, and really, really be unafraid. And I think it, I think it stems from this idea that, that we uh, feel very unfamiliar and very afraid to question this idea of question, the idea of God. It starts with that. And I was really young. I asked my dad, I said, I don't, I said, I, I don't, how do we know it's God? How do you know it's Jesus? And he, and he dropped me off at a Buddhist day camp. He dropped me off at Scientology in the middle of Hollywood. He dropped me off at, um, I went and studied Mormonism with some friends from, from, from basketball practice. He dropped, he took me to Japan and I studied Shintoism, Hinduism. And, and, and he refused to let me make a decision unless I was adequately educated. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's like, if you want to question God and have questions, go out and seek. But every time you go to this day camp, we're going to sit down, we're going to process what do you think? And I would go, I would go to the, 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 the different day camps or the different, like different um, services. And I'd come back and be like, that definitely isn't it. Well, this definitely isn't it. And at one point he just said, and he's like, Aaron, at some point you have to, to figure out what you believe. And he's like, and I remember I, I sat there and I told him, I said, dad, how do you, I know I believe in Jesus. I've already met Jesus, but I just have so many questions. And he's like, it's okay to have questions. God's bigger than your questions. And, and I truly, something that's so simple that, that, um, I refer to as like when I was a child, but I do still believe that to be true now is that God is much bigger than our questions and it's okay to question and it's okay to challenge and it's okay to understand. And I know that we're never to test God, but I do think, I do think God understands that, that in maybe in our brokenness or maybe in just our humanity, that we have tons of questions that we're curious people, that we're curious beings. And that I don't think it ever makes him inferior when we have moments of, of, of going, God, are you out there? I think if anything, God wants us to always be asking so that we, he can show up in every moment. And I think the thing that I've learned in all of this is to see that God has been moving in my life, um, throughout my life, even the moments where I didn't believe, right? If anything, I hated God. He was there working intricately, moving in my life, opening doors, closing them, moving me from places of danger into places of more danger, <laughs> and, and, and I, and I, and I, I think we as humans have just this, 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 this journey to go on where we have to continue to ask questions and we have to create safe spaces for our children and the next generation to go, okay, look, like, let's not start from this expectation that you love Jesus. Let's start from this expectation that Jesus needs to meet you where you're at in your journey and that you're mm -hmm. going to meet Jesus in your life. And, and I'm really appreciative that my dad and that Hillsong and, and the Houston's create that, you know? Well, and it's a huge thing, like to hear you say that your dad, you know, took you to Buddhist camp and, and had you study these yeah. different things, that would make some Christian parents feel so uncomfortable, you know, the idea of oh. even letting you know that Scientology existed would make some people yeah. feel so uncomfortable. And yet it was a freedom that your family, your dad gave you. And to me, it makes me think of some of the problems that you talk about in the show with the church and maybe some of its, you know, beliefs around letting people think freely and different things like that, whatever yeah. people's issues have been. But I think what, what you communicate in the middle of that is that you saw all these different problems and maybe these challenges within the church, but got to a point where you took ownership over them and said, the church is actually my problem, my thing that I'm going to do something to fix. Talk us through that journey and, and what some of those problems were, were and then how you actually decided to take ownership over changing them. Yeah. You know, when I, when I, met, um, when I met Pastor Carl Lentz in New York, 
I was so shocked because growing up, I think I was 22 when I first met um, Pastor Carl and it meant nothing to me. I didn't know who he was. He was just tattooed and had a hoodie on and I thought he was a drug dealer. And, and, and not to say that, just, just, just having no context, having no context. And then my dad's like, do you know who that is? And I'm like, I don't know who that is. Do you know who that is? And he's like, he's a pastor and you'd really like him. So you maybe should be nice to him. And I was, remember having this moment, but I remember, I remember being in this place and, and kind of, and kind of um, understanding for the first time that there were people out there like Pastor Carl Lentz that actually liked my dad and actually really respected him. And, and I grew up in such a, maybe a hostile environment where my dad was very much forward thinking, especially for Southern California, where so much of it was. A uh, certain type of thinking, and 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 I was really criticized and kind of ridiculed. And my first year of college, I went to a Baptist college, and, and there's nothing against Baptists or any different denomination. But I lived on a dorm room floor where it was all the theology majors, and I was a business major. And and one day they all came in my room and said, "So why is your dad a heretic?" And I was like, "I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. I, I, which which you know which belief are you questioning?" And and I think for the first time for me, it was, I didn't really like Christians. I, it was so much, not so much the church. It was, it was the people who filled the church. I didn't, wasn't really a fan. And so for, for me to find people who were my tribe and were my people, people who accepted me and people also who maybe didn't agree with everything my dad believed, but, um, but had a respect and an honor for people who put themselves out there to preach Jesus and speak on Jesus and, and, and share the gospel with the world they were able to, to find that common denominator. And, and, and for me, I think the biggest, the biggest thing is who we are as Christians. And I look back at my life and go, man, I offended so many people. My temperament, my, 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 the way I am, the way I'm, I'm a bad friend at times. And, and there's so many things I, hurdles I have to, to jump over and mountains I gotta climb. But, but I think it is really the betterment of ourselves to be a better tribe as a whole. What happens when, when people get to know us and, and know us well, will be, I think, the, the, the test of time, will last the test of time, will be our reputation. And I think as we open ourselves up more as the church to be accepting and to be open-minded, I think it's just different. I think it's it's being willing to accept people for who they are, even if mm. they're very different than us. And I think Christians, even as Christians, we have such a hard time politically accepting, whether it's the left or the right. And you know, I'm in the U.S. and it is a, it is a melting pot of of anger when it comes to the president or to the governors or to the mayors and it, everyone. And then it's vote your faith. And then, but in, in Arkansas, voting your faith is blue. And in Georgia, voting your faith, faith, faith is red conservative. And it's, and, and both, and everyone's going to hell if you don't vote your faith. So I guess we're all going to go there if, if we don't. And it's so confusing. <laughs> we make it so difficult. And I think we have to remember that it really is about being a great neighbor and loving each other and loving Jesus and, and, and starting there, you know, it sounds cheesy, but it genuinely is, I think the foundation of what we believe in who we are as humans. Hey, Aaron, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for um, having hopefully me. Hopefully we can do it actually in LA sometime in person. Yes. <laughs> come, come whenever. Be our guest.